Thanks. The reality is we're in a country and a society where you tend to want more. You want more money. You want more friends. You want more shoes. In the case of my wife, I think that's not possible. <laughs> but if you have soaring ambitions, what you really want is you want to have more of something than everybody else. And in 2006, commanding a task force in Iraq, I had more connectivity than any military commander in history. More full motion video, more computer linkages, more radio linkages. I could talk to more places, more people than Napoleon, than Alexander, than Wellington, than Robert E. Lee. Now, I didn't say I was better general than them, but I had more connectivity. I could reach prime ministers and presidents, sergeants, and privates. I was really connected. But I couldn't reach this guy. <laughs> now, this is not one of my special operations commanders. He looks like one. <laughs> but in reality, this is Rooster. He is my daughter-in-law's cat. He lives in the D.C. area. He's a little overweight. He doesn't do anything. He's thinking about running for Congress, where I told him he'd fit in. But the thing about Rooster is, I send him email, I send him chats, I call him now and again, I don't hear a word. But I go over to their house and I rub his belly. And I think we're connected. Because where I grew up, if somebody rubs your belly, you're connected. <laughs> now I'm going to ask you as leaders, and you're all leaders, not just generals commanding armies or CEOs at corporations, but also nurses in operating rooms, and teachers in classrooms, and parents and families. We're all leaders. So the question to ask yourself, are you connected? And typically, if I ask you that, you reach down to see if you got your cell phone, how many bars you got. Or do you have Wi-Fi for your iPad? And if you're really an important person, you don't carry those things, but you look over to your right or left, and your assistant is burdened down with all that stuff, and your assistant goes, Roger, I got it. <laughs> and you are reassured that you have connectivity. But the question to ask ourselves is, do you have real connections? Because I believe that connectivity in today's world doesn't guarantee that you have the connections that matter. Connectivity has always been the holy grail. How we could talk better. If you look at the march of technology, particularly for military forces, every leader wanted to be connected to more people in real time than ever before. And you go back to history at the Battle of Waterloo, the Duke of Wellington used flags, but he also rolled up little pieces of paper and he put them in the uh, buttonholes of his waistcoat. And when he wanted to communicate with somebody, he'd write a real quick message, he'd give it to a messenger, they'd write it over. And that was connectivity for him. General Meade at the Battle of Gettysburg, the Union commander, was linked by telegraph to Washington, D.C., which I'm not sure he was happy about. But he used flags, bugles, and runners on the battlefield to be connected, to have connectivity with his commanders. And during the First World War, General Pershing, who commanded American forces, had a huge wire system where they would run telephone wires from the very forward trenches all the way back to the headquarters. And it allowed him to speak to all parts of the force at the same time. But because the wires couldn't be moved very easily, it also stuck him in that location because as soon as he moved away from where all the wires connected, he moved away from his connectivity. And suddenly he lost the ability to have that which he had wanted so much. And for those of you who are familiar with the war in Vietnam, we had radios by that point, but we also had helicopters and commanders would sometimes fly over a unit on the ground and they'd talk by radio to them and they'd watch them. And they'd have the sense that I am connected to the people on the ground. Well, all that paled in comparison to what we had in Iraq. In my situational awareness room or operations center, we had banks of big flat screen TVs where we get predator downlink, what we call full motion video. You could watch all of our operations in real time. You could listen because we pumped it through our secure internet. You could listen to every radio conversation from the senior people down to the lowest team leader of every firefight, not just in Iraq, but in, in the other countries we were operating in, all simultaneously. 
right sitting at that one place I could call, or I could watch, I could video teleconference, I could do all of those things with this extraordinary range of people and places for the first time ever. And when you brought people in, particularly outside visitors, they would just be amazed and they say, you know everything. And there's a temptation, and I found it myself, I would sit there and I'd say, I know everything. And what really happened was the technology that was so good had first enamored me, and then it had seduced me, and then I was bound by it. Those which we think are our servants become our masters. Connectivity, which we've always wanted in particularly great amounts, gives us the illusion of knowing. And what I mean is if you see what happens outside a window, people on a street, and you see them talking, you start to say, I know what's happening. If they look like they're arguing, you have a sense, I know there's an argument going on. But in reality, and particularly in combat, where you have the ability to see and you can listen to radio calls, you start to develop this illusion that you have what we call situational awareness, an understanding, an appreciation, an empathy for what is happening to the people on the ground. But in reality, you don't. You don't feel the cold wind. You don't hear the dogs barking. You don't hear the peculiar crack that a bullet round makes when it goes near you. You don't feel the grip of fear. You're not there. And if you think that because you've got certain senses fed by these connections that you understand, you can deceive yourself. I think that happens in our lifetimes now as well. Because we have a connection, the connectivity with someone, we tend to think we're connected. I have four brothers to whom I'm very close, and we all carry cell phones. And I can call any one of my brothers at any moment, but I don't. And I think I don't because we all have cell phones, and I go, well, I can call at any moment I need to, so I just won't do it this moment. And in reality, we don't talk very much. And I think that's because we have this illusion that we are connected just because the physical connectivity exists and makes us feel comfortable. Real connections are a bit different. Real connections come when people engage, when there is eye contact, when there's a hand on the shoulder, when there is conversation that is not one way. At the Battle of Gettysburg in the Civil War, on the third day, as Pickett's famous charge, General Winfield Scott Hancock had already arrayed his forces. He'd done all the things a general can do to get ready for the fight. And then he, at the height of the battle, he rode his horse up to the top of Cemetery Ridge and rode parallel to the enemy attack, which was literally suicide because he needed his forces to see him. He needed to connect with them in a way. He'd already given all the orders he was going to give. He wasn't going to make any difference, except he was going to connect with them in a way that is more human and more deep than sometimes we pretend we achieve in other ways. My high school baseball coach, and I went to high school near here, he used to, when he was unhappy with what you did, he'd come to you and he'd grab you by your sideburns and he'd lift you up until you were on your toes. And that hurt a lot, but he connected with me. <laughs> I got it. So how do you get those connections? You know, they're built over time. They don't suddenly happen. You don't send somebody an email and have that kind of connection. Usually it's built through something you go through, but very difficult school, some experience. And the U.S. Army Ranger School takes people through this 58-day thing where they don't feed you much, they don't let you sleep much, and most of the value is in creating these bonds between people, how you know to connect when it's really hard, when you're stripped down to the basic. I believe that for a great event, if I was put back in command of Afghanistan, the first recommendation I would make would be the president, vice president, secretary of defense, director of the CIA, commander, all go whitewater rafting. Take two cases of beer and go whitewater rafting. <laughs> Don't talk about the war, just bond. 
just get to know each other. So how do you know when you've got real connections? You could glibly say it's who's going to come to your funeral if they're not in the will, and if it's not raining and Homeland's not on. <laughs> but in the reality, you'll feel it. You'll know that the people, not who you get texts from, it's not the number of followers or friends you have, it's the people with whom you connect, the people you could call early in the morning just to talk or late at night for a favor. It is people for whom you have built a relationship that can be buttressed and reinforced by modern connectivity but not replaced by it. Now, what does this mean for leaders? What does it mean for you? First, I don't want you to go out here and throw away your iPod and your iPad and your, your cell phone. First off, Apple would go out of business and that would tip the stock market. And then the National Security Agency would have nothing to listen to, so what would they do? <laughs> so you've got to think wider. At the end of the day, you really want to think who you're connected to. And are you connected to the people that really matter? Thank you very much.